Hello, this is Minister Leonard Harris, and once again, it is an honor and a privilege to be before you for this Sunday, May the 22nd, 2022. And we are coming from the Faithway Study Guide, and this is Lesson 12, and still in Unit 3, which is titled, Liberating Letters. And then the title or the subject matter for this lesson is Freed to Love. Freed to Love. Our devotional reading is 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. Verses 19 through 23. And then our background scripture is the same as our printed passage. And that is Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 15. And our key verse is the 14th verse out of the fifth chapter of Galatians. And it reads, I'm reading from the NIV. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we have three items for our lesson's aims. The first is discern the difference between legalism and the freedom that comes with responsibility. Number two, experience freedom as trusting in the work of Christ rather than your own efforts for salvation. And three is, choose a life of freedom in Christ that is guided by serving and loving others with humility. And our lesson has three different parts to it. And the first would be from the fifth chapter of Galatians, verses 1 through 5. And the first subtitle is Righteousness by Faith. And then verses 6 through 10 is reap by faith and verses 11 through 15 are renounce by faith so we have righteousness by faith reap by faith and then renounce by faith and before we begin we would like to open with prayer Heavenly Father, creator of all that is, the author and the finisher of our faith, we first just pause to say thank you. Thank you for all the things that we don't mention, things that we sometimes take for granted or feel that they are just natural. But Father, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father, we realize that our being is because of your love and your grace and your kindness and your forgiveness. So, Father, we just say thank you for continuing to do what you do for us all the time in spite of ourselves. Thank you, Father, for looking beyond our faults and seeing our needs. And we just ask that as we indulge into this lesson, that those things that you have already set forth, that you would impart unto us the things that you would have us to know and understand. And then as always, Father, don't let us just be hearers of your word, but compel us by your spirit to be doers as well. And we ask it all in the name of Christ. And for his sake, we ask it. Amen. Now, 
As we look at our lesson, we want to just kind of briefly highlight the setting of it. Paul is in Galatia and um, he is speaking to uh, kind of a uh, uh, mixed group. Um, there are those there that are Jews. There are those that are uh, new coming uh, Christians. Uh, there are those that are not totally compelled uh, by the practices of uh, Judaism. Uh, they are not Judaizers uh, or legalistic or legalizers, but then there is a group that very much are motivated and uh, pretty much uh, kind of confounded by the practice of the legal terms, rituals, ceremonies, and practices of those that are Jews. And then Paul is trying to connect with this group, but also his emphasis is on trying to reach those that are not of this group. And so he's in an era and in a location in Galatia where they have been somewhat described as kind of fickle, uh, somewhat easily impressed with new things. Uh, it kind of uh, infuses their curiosity, and uh, they are somewhat um, kind of, uh, you know, swayed from one thing to another. And so the dilemma that uh, we find here is, is that at the time that Paul is addressing the church in Galatia, he has like uh, two practices. Uh, one is involving the purity of doctrine, and the other one is the purity of conduct. And there are those that feel that, uh, yes, the salvation of Christ that you're preaching about, uh, that is uh, necessary. It is a requirement that belief is in order. But also, along with that, there is a requirement on the behavior that follows behind that. And so then there becomes a certain guideline or rudiments that have been established in practice and rituals and customs. And then they begin to take precedent over the issue of salvation is through Christ. And so uh, these things become like prerequisites uh, requirements. Uh, if you say you believe in Christ, then you ought do this. Then if you are a believer now in the teachings of Christ, then also you must do these things. And they somehow uh, became impediments, obstacles, if you will, in the way of trying to first uh, provide the teaching of Christ, the doctrines of Christ, and then uh, trying to uh, bring the unknown and the un-Christianized uh, uh, people who already are being persuaded by any new nuances or new trends or new things that are being introduced into this area. And now, along with accepting your new thing, your nuance, there's some stipulations that come along with it. And so this is the scenario in which Paul finds himself. And so we want to... Uh, 
begin the righteousness or righteous by faith. And uh, that is a mouthful in itself, but it is the one of the most uh, profound and conclusive uh, expressions or explanations of our faith. Righteous by faith. Not, not righteous in faith or not righteousness to have faith, but righteous by faith. And so uh, let's look at what Paul says. I'll be reading uh, from the NIV, except for maybe a couple of uh, verses. Uh, I'll read the King James and then contrast it uh, with the NIV. So starting at uh, the first verse out of chapter 5 of Galatians. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now the King James says be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So uh, I like the uh, uh, King James wording because sometimes we can put so much emphasis on things until we find our si ourselves more bonded to the emphasis that we've placed on things than we are to what we said we were practicing these things for. So we become more attached to the rudiments of what it is we've established that kind of denotes that now I know that you are a believer because I see all of the different steps and the sequential order of how you do things. So now I know your conduct is matching what you verbally say. And sometimes we can put so much pressure and raise such a high level of expectation on the steps, procedures, and process that we lose sight of what it was we were supposedly doing all those things for in the first place. And so uh, Paul is saying, make sure in the process you don't get yourself all entangled and tied up and then find yourself bound to practices above your salvation. And so uh, he goes on and he says, mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. And so Paul is saying, if you start getting yourself all worked up about following steps of procedures and uh, making sure that you have checked off different little sequential orders and rituals and rudiments, if you start getting yourself, allowing yourself to start following in that practice, then what you do will take precedent over what Christ did for you. Because then you'll start believing that if you falter in one of these areas here, that now you have forsaken your practice. And now there are blemishes on your record. Uh, and so what, what he says here is, is that if you start going through these steps of procedures, uh, that then uh, you miss one of them. Well, now all of a sudden, you, your walk 
is of no value at all because now you got to go back and correct what you did, not realizing that Christ died to cover our faults so that through the shedding of innocent blood of Christ that we would be forgiven for honest, unintentional mistakes. And so Paul goes on and he says, again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You can't just check off boxes one, two, three, four, and then skip five and six, and then go to seven, eight, and nine. Now there will be some who will be watching and say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> you missed five and six. You got to go back. You can't be part way there. We used to sing the song all the time, 99 and a half won't do. But I would like to revise that and say, he paid it all. The 100% uh, certainly in spirit, that is what we're trying to achieve. But if we miss it, he paid it all. So uh, don't get all tangled up uh, trying to fulfill certain parts of the law and then find yourself that you were inadequate, you failed, you faltered on one of them. And now, even though you accomplished some of it, but because you missed one or two, now uh, you've been discredited. Uh, you've been, uh, there's blemishes on your record. Now, uh, there's no uh, recognition or appreciation for what you have accomplished. So it says just one messes up now. Okay, now you're obligated to do the whole law. So it says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. And here's where I exchange uh, King James and the NIV. I like the wording in the King James on the fifth verse. For it says, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, if we move further and go to the verses 6 through 10, uh, and then uh, we want to look at the father of the Hebrew nation, and we want to see uh, this emphasis on circumcision, how did that apply to Abraham? And... Was it a prerequisite uh, for Abraham before he became the father of many nations? So verses 6 through 10 say, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts or the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then it says, you were running a good race. You were doing what you were supposed to do. You had dedicated yourself to this journey and you were in the race full force. But then somebody left their lane and they crossed over into your lane. And so Paul says it this way. He said, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who called you. And then it identifies what that behavior is like the one who came over and crossed into your lane 
while you were focused looking straight ahead and running a good race. It says, a little yeast works through the whole bunch of dough or the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. So Paul is identifying that in this race, there'll be people that are going to come and they're going to throw different things into your lane. Uh, They're going to try to trip you. They're going to try to cause some type of failure as you're running the race. And Paul identifies it as just a little yeast. And just the little yeast in the batch of dough causes it to rise, causes it to expand. And so we used to say one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. And so what Paul is saying is, uh, don't, uh, even though there will be an attempt for this to take place, but don't allow these things to hinder you in the race. And he gives the confirmation and he says, I'm confident in this one thing that if you don't look at any other view, if you don't look in any other direction, the one who is trying to throw you into confusion, whoever that may be. And I like that part there. So it doesn't just focus on people that may already be, uh, termed or may already be identified as the opposition. These are the folks to watch out for. Be careful because you know they have a history of always trying to impede somebody's race. So watch out for these. But it says whoever that might be, it might be a friend or a foe. It might be a relative or just an associate. It might be someone in a group that's already defined that we too don't get along. But whoever it is, Paul says, that person will have to pay the penalty. Now, before we go into the uh, last five verses here. I wanted to bring out this uh, distinction between the issue of circumcision or uncircumcision. And I thought there would be no better person to, to give credence to this other than Abraham himself. So let's just read what the fourth chapter of Romans says, and I will start it at the uh, ninth verse. And Romans 4, verse 9 says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Uh, This takes us back uh, to the uh, fifth verse uh, of Galatians 5. So it goes on and it says, How then was it accounted? Was it done while he was circumcised? Or uncircumcised. Not while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. And as he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believed, 
though they are circumcised, that righteous, I'm sorry, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed or applied to them also. So it served a practice here that the righteousness of Abraham wasn't accounted to him because he was circumcised. No, it was accounted because of his faith, because of his act of faith, because he sacrificed, because he submitted unto the will of God, and because he showed that he believed and had faith in God. That was what was accounted to him as righteousness. Not that he had followed a procedure, a a physical, a outward expression, a medical procedure for men, but it was not, his righteousness was not based upon this act, which here in Galatians, Certain people had now uh, said who were very legalistic were saying that they can't be followers. They can't be true believers if they're not circumcised. And something we should reflect upon here, uh, Abraham, upon the birth of his son, Isaac, uh, Abraham was instructed by God to have him circumcised on the eighth day of his being. So while he was a child, it was a requirement then in the Hebrew law, it was a requirement for males to be circumcised on the eighth day. We are now talking about grown adult men probably in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, maybe some even in their 60s. And now this group is saying that we have a prerequisite in order for you to follow Christ and receive the salvation. You must first be circumcised. So uh, let's... let's, uh, put the whole ball of wax together here and see uh, the predicament that Paul finds himself in. So now, uh, as we read further, the 12th verse says, And the father of circumcision to those who are not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So sometimes, humorously I say this, we make the comment, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Well, if it was okay for Abraham to be the father of many nations. And if he is the beginning of the faith, then it should be okay for present day believers coming in that, uh, as Paul is teaching, we're not going to allow the practice of circumcision become the impediment, the stumbling block, the obstacle that uh, prevents new souls coming into the practice of the belief of Christ. Now, our last uh, section, verses 11 through 15, and it says, Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. 
as for those agitators. Now here, I want again borrow from the King James on verse 12 because it reads differently than what it does in the NIV. And in the King James it says, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brothers and sisters, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty. You have been called into freedom. Only use not freedom for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Just because you've been afforded this freedom which we have in Christ Jesus, as the scripture says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Freed from all of the uh, guidelines, all of the established rudiments and practices of mankind, but free to mature and to develop and to grow into the spiritual presence that God would have us to be. And so it says... For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you may, or take heed that you be not consumed by one another. The NIV says, watch out or you will be destroyed by one another. And this comes by what? By us placing more significance on certain practices and certain rituals than we do on the souls of our brothers and sisters. We find something, sometimes uh, people choose things that are of no sacrifice or accountability of themselves. So they find something that's comfortable for them. It's been accomplished for them it's something that they've already achieved and it's been achieved so long ago until they don't recall or remember what the process was in the course of achieving it and they then make that a requirement for others because it's no cost to me but it may be like a mountain for someone else. And so what Paul is trying to teach us here is, is that do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Love your neighbor, whether they are known or unknown, but love your brothers and your sisters as yourself. And uh, so we can distinguish in your spare time, so we can distinguish the identity and the practice of my neighbor. In your leisure, in the book of Luke, the 10th chapter, uh, starting at verse 30 through verse 37, Christ gives us the example of who is my neighbor. And I'm sure many of us 
are familiar with this passage is being identified as the Good Samaritan. So as we leave you, we hope that something that we've said uh, has bared some fruit and that it was beneficial and also that it was a part of our spiritual development as we continue in this race along this journey. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.